Apparently my presentation is not loaded. Do I have to stand here and talk or can I stand down there? You need to record it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have abandoned that as soon with, as possible. With that horrendous yeah. blue light. Thank you. So good afternoon. Welcome to the graveyard session. Please don't fall asleep or throw tomatoes. I hope this will be vaguely interesting. Do I just press the right arrow? I'm a bit old-fashioned with new software. So I cannot remember who the culprit of this dreadful term hydro-solidarity is. I think it's Dunsile from Sanby or Pearl. It's one of you guys. It's one of you guys. But for some reason, when there was a call for abstracts, it's, it resonated with us and we said, yes, let's talk about it. And now I actually don't know what it means, really. So I'm hoping that all you brilliant catchment people will help me unpack it a bit. Um, there's been some very technical talk earlier. It's been really awesome and, and inspiring. And as a geographer, I've been quite energized. Um, but this is more of the fluffy stuff, which I think is the dot connecting matrix for what we do in our landscapes. And Hydro solidarity, I'm not really sure what it means, as I said. Um, if anybody comes up with <laughs> a brilliant, a brilliant um, interpretation of the phrase, please interrupt me and put your hand up. But essentially, what I'm presenting, I work for a very small organization. We're a whole eight people based in Matat. That's our headquarters. We don't have a, a head office anywhere else. Does anyone know where Matatiel is, other than Richard? Yay! <laughs> Augustine hasn't been there yet, but he knows where we are. Um, so even though I work for ERS, Environmental and Rural Solutions, we're a funny little social enterprise, we are part of a much bigger family called the Umzumbubu Catchment Partnership Program, which was born officially in early 2013, and it's a, a collaboration of about 35 different organizations. It's civil society driven, but it's, it's state endorsed, I suppose. We, we have quite a few signatories on our memorandum of understanding, including water affairs, environmental affairs, land affairs, and a couple of the, the big punches, which is, is pretty, pretty awesome to have signed on to an MOU, which is really consolidating a common vision around water security and livelihoods within the Umzumbubu catchment. So the way we see hydro solidarity is, is collaboration. We are not very technical people. We, we get on with doing things on the ground. We're very bad at M&E and research and, and science but we seem to be making some difference on the ground in terms of, of impacting positively on livelihoods. So for those few of you in the room who don't know where the Umzumbubu catchment is, we span three of the strategic water source areas. As you know, there are 22 of them across southern Africa. They form only 8% of the land surface, and they generate more than 50% of our freshwater resources, which is pretty, makes them pretty high up on our focus agenda. We are also in Erosion Central. This is a, an Agricultural Research Council map which was produced quite a few years ago and it's terrifying. Um, the red dot, the eastern red dot is guess where? It's <laughs> the Ntabalunga Dam site which is a bit of a no-brainer but that's politically un-PC to say. So don't record that, we're recording people. <laughs> So we, we have quite a few challenges. We have a very high silt load, high erosivity in our catchment, some, some very interesting soils. We also have massive alien plant infestation. We did a bit of a, a digitizing exercise a while back. We have one of the highest percentages of wetlands of any local municipality in the country. 10% of Matatiel municipality's surface is wetlands, hopefully more, Rich, if you were to come and do your beautiful mapping exercise there. And almost 10% is also covered by invasive black and silver wattle, which is pretty frightening. We also have huge social challenges. Um, people have very little access to, to bulk services and the kind of resources and services that we expect in our modern way of living. And yet people are very adaptable. I, I like to think that people in these areas are probably more resilient to long-term climate change than a lot of people living in urban areas. So I'm not going to read you all the statistics they're, they're there and they're scary, and uh, people are, are very dependent on the resources <coughs> excuse me, emanating from this landscape. It's a, it's a beautiful landscape, but it's, it's pretty degraded. It's, it's very transformed in places, and this sort of overuse through generally overstocking and, and poor management results in 
loss of our greatest resource. There's an estimation, and this was about five, six years ago, that we, use, we lose 50 tons per hectare per year, which I just find staggering when you try and turn that into truckloads of soil moving off a hectare per year. But it's essentially all being exported out into the Indian Ocean, 408 kilometers away from the source at Port St. John's. And uh, I shudder to think what's happening to the marine ecology <laughs> with this beautiful silt load. Our latest threat, as I'm sure you're all aware, is a um, shale gas exploration, which has just received its exploration right from DMR. They don't have their mining right, and we've submitted a ton of appeals on behalf of the chiefs, who are the communal land rights custodians in the area, and from Umzumbi Catchment Partnership Program. So we're fighting quite a legal battle at the moment. And things can be doomy and gloomy, but we also have this stunning hotspot that we live in, the Maputa Land, Ponda Land, Albany hotspot, and there's our beautiful catchment. Um, so we are we really rich, actually. We're rich in people, we're rich in biodiversity, we're rich in altitudinal change, we're rich in a lot of things, and we're really rich in water. Um, we are very rural, 70%. The catchment, not just the Matatil municipality, is, is a rural landscape, which is quite unusual in, in modern South Africa. It's a rural functional landscape. And some of our interesting t statistics, the Umzimbibu is the third, apparently, the third largest river system in southern Africa, not just South Africa, draining over 2 million hectares. We also contribute apparently over 70% of the water volume to water management area 7. Matome may correct me, but we have this crazy water management area if you look at the, the spread. I think Matome or somebody showed a map of it earlier where the northeastern section of the water management area provides the bulk of the water um, to the bigger demand which has no water in the southern side. So the, the, uh, the, the PE that area which has huge demand, huge development, just does not have water. So we're strategically very important, us northern forgotten corner of the Eastern Cape. We also have the highest sediment load of any river in South Africa, including the Tsitsa, where the Ntabalanga Dam is going to be built. So hopefully nobody will ever build a dam on the Umzavubu because it will just become an agricultural floodplain pretty quickly. We have some challenging demographics. Um, the Umzavubu forms 20% of the Eastern Cape population. It has an incredibly rapid growth rate. The 2016 social census indicated 8.5% population growth rate, which is about three times the national average. It's, it's quite frightening. 40% um, of these people live below what we call the dreaded poverty line. Um, I don't, I'm not a fan of a lot of these indicators because even though these people live below the poverty line, they actually have a not bad quality of life. They have a lot of security in many senses, water security, agricultural security. Um, it's, it's a different level, and we, we actually need a means to measure many of these indicators because we often throw away these rural areas saying, oh, they're, they're impoverished and they're hopeless and they're unproductive, and yet we're not looking at their intrinsic assets and richness. We have a huge dependency ratio. Somebody earlier mentioned, I think, one to four. Um, the Umzumbibu um, local municipalities are up to nine people per income earner. We have a Working for Water project where we have 115 employees, and they have, I think it's over 870 dependents, direct dependents. So, <laughs> Viva NRM program. <laughs> Um, we have a big population, over one, or just shy of one and a half million, that are depending on the catchment itself, not just on the water and all the other resources being generated. So, on to the, the more fluffy social part, the Umzumbibu Catchment Partnership Program, which was formed in May 2013, I think, think we signed the MOU, um, has a very interesting composition. I mentioned it a little bit earlier, and I'm not going to go into it. This is a little bit out of date. We do have a few more universities and others signed on, which is great, and one who pulled out because of our stance against the shale gas exploration, which was pretty interesting. So our, when I say our, we're a weird organization, the, the Umzabibi Catchment Partnership, because we're not really an entity. We're a, we're a coalition. We have a common purpose and a common vision. We work around hydro solidarity, whatever the heck it finally means. Um, but we have quite a few products that have come out of collaborative implementing. And 
One of the key ones that's really touching lives is this Meet Naturally. We've worked very closely with Conservation South Africa, Institute of Natural Resources, and Lima mainly, to look at mobile auctions which go to villages and link with a rangeland stewardship revival, which is bringing back old, when I say old, uh, tra traditional livestock rotational rest methods, which used to work in the past before people were forced into villages and fences were put up. So there's been a great recognition of these traditional systems and, and a huge embracing of them. And many of the communities that we're working with have signed conservation agreements, which have grazing plans, and their incentives to sign these grazing plans are mobile auctions. And the more compliant they are with the grazing plan, the less percentage they pay on their sales. So if I sold an ox for 10,000 rand, 3% of that comes off to cover the, the mobile auction costs. And Conservation South Africa, which is one of our key partners in the landscape, has formed a, a little offshoot entity called Meet Naturally PTY, which is hopefully going to become a Southern African entity. They are basically running these mobile auctions, and we do the, as ERS, Lima, INR, we do the work on the ground mobilizing communities. But it, it couldn't be done without that collaborative nature of the Umsabubu catchment partnership. Some of the impacts that this meet naturally rangeland stewardship landscapes and livelihoods, we're very bad at names. We don't know what hydro solidarity means. We don't know what our models are called. We really need some help. We just do the stuff. We don't name it very well. We've sold over a thousand cattle through a three-year pilot project, um, which has reached over 55 villages. It's in five traditional authority areas. Over 190 households have been reached, and they are starting to make an average of 43,000 rand income per household per year, which is, is pretty good just from farming grass. It's not as if you have to trek off to Joburg and pay rent and stay somewhere and break up the family. Um, so there, there are a whole lot of other benefits. It's not just cash income and improved grazing management and, and hydrology. The exciting bit, and Duncan actually got us excited about this, he said it's jobs without the job fund, is the turnover from these pilot auctions has been in excess of, I think, 8.6 million, and that's just money into people's pockets. That's not funding. That's grass being turned into red meat off the hoof. Um, 255, if you take an EPWP job equivalent, 255 people per year would have a job, and this is just through farming grass managing cattle on the, on the rangelands. We've got a lot of improved grassland. We've got a bunch of agreements that have been signed. The stocking rates have improved. They're, they're more compliant with the carrying capacity. And the carrying capacity has also been improved because of, of better biomass and biodiversity and ground cover. And the animal health has increased, which is important because we don't want to actually destock the land. Grasslands need grazers, and they need that stimulation, and people need the income. So it, it's actually becoming quite a win-win. And it's been a big mind shift for us because cattle used to be the enemy. They were the degrading tools, and they are now the restoration tools just under proper management. We've got a very nice relationship as the Umzabubu Catchment Partnership. Is this the pointer? It's, nothing's going to explode. There we go. Uh, Dartmouth University which is based on the east coast of the states, um, has a bunch of third-year students which do their environmental science African exchange program with us as the Umzumbubu catchment. And we give them all the work that we can't get to, the pulling together of the felt assessments and bringing data out of you know, the cool work that's being done but that we don't have time to pull together. And they, they've put together some really nice summaries of what these projects are doing on the ground. So they spend time interviewing stock owners and grazing associations and eco-rangers and mamas who collect thatch off the rested areas. And they've come up with some really great stuff. I'm not going to go through it all now. It's, it's on our website, and I'll give you the reference later. But there's some really cool kind of wow moments that, that these guys have raised to us. One of the wow things that is coming out of this is using wattle as a stock feed. Wattle's always been this paradox species. It's been kind of the enemy, apart from a little bit of firewood and building material. Maybe we use it for a bit of erosion control, but an innovative farmer down the road, down the road in Cedarville, um, realized that he, ha he did not have enough grazing. He woke up one morning and he said, my farm is full of wattle instead of grass. What am I going to do with this stuff? 
And his son had just dropped out of biology and left him with this very expensive textbook lying on the, on the dining room table. And he started reading through it, and he, he came across this, this um, um, I don't know, diagram about how um, high tannins can be processed and made more acceptable to ruminants. And he started testing, and, and we've had a bit of interaction with him and taken some of the um, grazing association people to him and him to the grazing association people, and they've come up with this amazing stock feed recipe that people are wintering their stock on. So they now have a winter fodder bank in their rested rangelands, as well as a supplementary feed and fat stock at the end of winter. So instead of having skinny, dying animals on the overgrazed rangelands, we now have fat animals making money at auctions, which normally would not have happened at that time of year. One of the other really nice products that's coming out of the collaboration is the EcoFutures program, which is really targeting rural youth that do not have tertiary opportunities, of which there are hundreds of thousands in the Eastern Cape communal landscape. So it's really enabling rural youth to choose green economy career paths which contribute to a resilient society. I'm sorry Sue's not here because she's been on our case about building resilient society. The, the other few products or outcomes of the Umzububu catchment are obviously the MOU, which ties us into a, a hydro solidarity vision. Um, we've had a very nice opportunity to comment on the resource quality objectives. Rich spoke about them a little bit earlier. There's been quite good consultation in the Umzububu catchment. I think it's been better than, than most catchments because we're on their case and we've got people like Matome and Lawrence from Water Affairs who buy into what UCPP is doing, the, the Umzububu catchment partnership. We've got some really interesting stuff, Alex, emerging out of land reform and sustainable land use planning where beneficiaries have just been given land and said, go farm. You know, and they're not farmers, they're not agricultural people at all. And so they're making big blundery mistakes and they've got DDT issuing compliance notices. And we're saying, hang on guys, you know, there's, there's a better way through this. How do we support these people? Sandby's got this, this land reform and biodiversity stewardship program that is in the process of being revived. How do we make it work? How do we, how do we actually bring it up to policy level as well, not just policy coming down? And then under pressure from our researchy type thinkers, mainly Mike Powell in the Ntabalangala Leni catchment, we've actually developed a research program formulation, which is quite amazing because we're really bad. We just do stuff. We don't actually think about it, plan it, record it, monitor it, and share it. We just get on and do stuff. So we have this amazing impact-oriented research, which I think quite a few other catchments are now jealous of and we're very proud of. And you can see it on our website as well. And I think I've got two minutes left, so I'm going to be quick. We do quite a bit of catchment awareness outreach with schools. This has never had funding, this type of activity. WWF very benevolently came on board this year, and we can do a lot more of this outreach. But one of the great benefits of collaboration is that you can pool resources where people have very limited resources. So, for example, a, a wetland day or a, a water awareness day is not a blah, blah, blah in a tent and have lunch. It's get out to schools. Somebody provides mini SAS kits, somebody else provides transport, somebody else will, will sponsor lunch, everybody provides facilitators. EWT has been very active and instrumental um, in this, and Lima and INR. And we've managed to clean up our act in Matatiol quite significantly. We've got huge point source pollution coming out of the town, it's frightening. But there's a lot of kids now taking action and it's, it's feeding into the Eco Futures program where Youngsters are saying, mm, there's actually a role for me in the green economy. You know, water's important. I can do something. I can make a change. One of the very exciting things that's coming out is a potential stewardship area. If you look at the dark green along the escarpment, this is Lesotho, north of the dark green. So that's the watershed. Matatiel town is here. So KZN is, is there. There's the, the boundary. So there's Swartberg, Underberg's out here somewhere. 65,000 hectares, all above 1,750 meters of very valuable, e.g. grassland and Drakensberg moist foothills and beautiful basalt. I don't know the names, Rich, of all the amazing grassland up there, but some amazing biodiversity and some challenges. We've got a porous border full of stock theft and fire and issues. But uh, Sand Parks, Jeff 5, Eastern Cape Parks are all looking to this area to secure it as a, as a water factory. We've used, we've used municipal language in, in trying to get this message across, speaking about IDPs and 
water factories, not about biodiversity and nature conservation and fences. And the Matatil municipality took a resolution two years ago that they want to secure the upper catchment as a water factory. I'm going to stop shortly. I'll tell you more about that later because the time Nazi is on my case. So this is what we don't want. We've, we've had some very brief strategic planning. We don't want degradation and pollution and loss and fire and damage. We do want a secure catchment and healthy, happy, empowered communities selling cattle off good rangelands. And the way we work is in collaboration. In this picture, there are 12 different organizations. I'm not going to mention them all. A lot of you will recognize yourselves. But this is how the Umzumbiwi catchment works. We are we anti-silo. Um, somebody, at, I think Mike Powell's got this terrible phrase called polycentric governance, which again, I'm not too sure what it means, but I think I know how to apply it. So essentially, our, our guiding philosophy is that we see sustainability as an emergent property of stakeholder interaction, not something that we're technically doing on the ground. We can only be technically effective if, as stakeholders, we are working together. And if somebody drops the ball, there's somebody else there to pick it up. So that's our story. There's a lot more on our website. It's actually quite a nice website. Duduzo is somewhere around, and he helped us set it, set it up. And if you'd like to share anything, post anything, take anything off it, yes, it is a little bit old-fashioned. We do have a Facebook page, but I can't remember the address. It'll be on the website. <laughs> but yeah, so that, that's our story.